This is a Rogue Media Network podcast. Coming up on the payoff, this guest has actually appeared on, on the Jimmy Kimmel show, Jimmy Fallon. Uh, he is terribly talented, uh, and he is ridiculously credentialed, 37 years as a urologist. He's a urologist, folks. He's not an actor or a, a pop star. He is a urologist. His name is Dr. Dick Chop, and he performs vasectomies. And more importantly, he's been sober for about 15 years. And this guy's got an unbelievable message. And he brings to the table once again the reminder that alcoholism is the great equalizer. We're talking about a guy who was at the top of his profession when he went to treatment for three and a half months. And if you have somebody in your life that needs to stop drinking, pass this on to them if you want. And if you want to hear some great music, this is the artist for you. Southern California, well, Philadelphia's own, residing now in Southern California. His album is, I've seen clips of music videos for this guy's new album. It's coming, folks. Kevin Souza. <laughs> Dr. Chop. How are you? Oh, man, I'm great. How you doing? Good, good. First of all, okay. thank you so much for taking the time. It is my pleasure, sir. It's my pleasure. I think it's just always really cool to show people that this affects very successful people. It's the great equalizer. I always call it, you know, alcoholism. And uh, so it's really cool that you're able to kind of share your story um, and just kind of yeah. help break the stigma. You'd be surprised who has this stuff. You know, it goes, it goes across all levels of society. Yeah. And I'll touch on that a little bit as we go along. So, um, yeah. I like to ask people, what what's your sobriety date? Yeah, my sobriety date is April 1st, 2007. Okay. And uh, April Fool's Day, you know, how appropriate. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's, 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 it's a great pleasure for me, Pete, to be able to talk with you and, and kind of share, share my experience in AA, you know, it's it probably, it seems like forever ago, but it, it also seems like yesterday that, you know, we were sitting in each other's seat wondering, you know, how we got here and what we're going to do and, you know, who, who's going to help us out and, you know, are we going to end up going off the cliff? So the, um, fortunately, I've got a, I've got a good sponsor here in Austin. His name is Charlie Parker. He doesn't mind me using his name. And before that, there's another gentleman that was our, was a sponsor for a few years before I met Charlie. His name was uh, Mark Houston, and he's one of the Oh, guys gosh, that, I've heard of that guy. Yeah, Mark Houston, and I think he's in the same league as Bill Wilson. You know? <laughs> was, the dude was a no BS guy. And, uh, and for people and, who don't uh, know, he's people, I guess he's one of those guys, like a speaker circuit guy. Um, that in the field oh, of yeah. recovery, people really lean on his stuff, uh, recordings, yeah, yeah. and you could YouTube Mark Houston and, and, and see some of his yeah, stuff. Exactly, exactly. And uh, and then the bit of the good news is that we meet every every Thursday night, even with the pandem pandemic. We did you know a lot of Zoom stuff, but uh, for me, I um, um, can't wait until we get we can get back to kind of live meet, meetings because for me, it's more knee to knee. I think helps me get in the in in tune with the rest of the guys i and, like how you say that knee to knee yeah because uh, yeah. i talk about that too i i like the i like the zoom meetings and 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 the smaller meetings but uh the big rooms with people uh they have a specific effect on me and no I, doubt about it. i don't need to put it into words but you know what i'm talking about and if somebody exactly. is listening to this podcast and they struggle with alcoholism you know we hope someday that that they'll find out what that is too. Cause it's the feeling I get, I now get the feeling from recovery that I used to get from drinking and, and using other drugs. I, I, I w exactly. wanted to take you back a little bit in the time machine. Yep. Do, you, do you remember your yeah. first drink? Oh yeah. No, no kidding. I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I think one hears about uh, alcoholics taking their first drink, you know, and how freeing it was and how enabling it was, you know, everything was, was great. So I remember my first drink, and I think I was about 14 because I wasn't driving yet. And we got my buddy and I got got hammered on lime flavored vodka of all the of all the you know rot that we could have found. <laughs> and and the next thing I knew, I'm on my hands and knees in the bathtub and, and, and turning inside out. 
And I told my dad, I remember telling him, I said, you know, I must have had some really bad pizza. <laughs> and he said, uh, he said, he said, told me that he thought the pepperoni must have been 100 proof. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I really didn't feel very empowered or very bulletproof at that point. And, and, and I didn't drink for a long time after that because that was no bueno for me at the time. How old were you? 14. Okay. 14. And, and you mentioned your father. Is there alcoholism in, in your family? Not my dad, but my mom, as it turns out, was, was an alcoholic. And, and it, it was manifest in her uh, later in life. But um, And her brother was an alcoholic. So, you know, there's probably some type of an alcohol gene thing. Uh, there's probably also the fact that uh, if kids are exposed to more traumatic events when they're younger, uh, which has happened in, in my case with my kids, uh, of a divorce when, you know, when they're, when they're growing up, some type of a traumatic event, it seems to make them more susceptible to alcoholism at an earlier age than if, if they had a more normal experience, if there is such a thing, you know? Yeah. But, yeah, 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 yeah. I got, I got to yeah. ask the question, are your children, are they in, in recovery? Are they? I think one of the great things about my story is that, uh, when I got back from Talbot Recovery Center in, in Atlanta in, in July of 2007, uh, I was back about three months and ended up taking my daughter to Talbot three months later. Wow. And, uh, and she's been, and she's been sober and in good shape ever since. And, and if that isn't good enough, uh, about two and a half years ago, my son, uh, got in the ditch and I ended up taking him to a recovery center in Colorado and he is now uh, help running one of the recovery centers here in Austin so huh. I mean what could be a better thing than to have both your kids in recovery and let them be actively working in it so it's, it's yeah yeah I mean you you I, I, this happened to my family both my brothers are sober and myself my dad was a alcoholic, you know, call very yeah. functional. And, uh, my brother, Michael got sober first and he, I mean, sort of like, it sounds like you did just snapped off that branch of the family tree. Uh, you know, hopefully. Right. Um, and we just, yeah. we communicate about it, snapping it in that sense. We, we talk about yeah. it. His daughter knows about his struggles. And, uh, I think there's something to be said for that. Uh, how it, you know, the alcoholism can run through the family, but so can the recovery. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. And, and, uh, and my son, uh, who's actively in, in recovery centers now, I mean, he, you could just see him bloom spiritually and, and just his whole body language and the way he talks and, and everything. It's just, I mean, it's, it's, you know, makes me, makes me tingle whenever I'm around. I mean, he's a great guy. Well, yeah, you, you, yeah. you've certainly got quite a story. And, uh, so, you know, you go ahead and kind of tell me and I'll just poke in, you know, what, what sure. exactly yeah. happened? Yeah. Well, um, you know, the, uh, um, I didn't do much drinking in, in high school except for, you know, except for that, <laughs> that blind flavored yeah. box. Yeah, thing. the 100 proof and, pepperoni. Yeah, I know it, I know it. And, you know, I grew up in a little town in northern Minnesota, just 6,000 people, we're 80 miles from the Canadian border. And, you know, and, and there was lots of hockey in the wintertime and snow and lots of mosquitoes in the rest of the year. And, you know, Minnesota in those days was one of the states that had just a 3.2% beer limit. And uh, you could drink a six-pack of that stuff, and it gave you a headache, but it didn't give you much of a buzz, you know. And uh, it was great news that some of our buddies went to Colorado or something like that and came back for some, with some Coors beer, which was 6%, which was a big deal. Yeah. But, um, you know, and then I went on to uh, um, college. And, and Minnesota at that time was also, you know, you had to be 21 to drink. And so we didn't do a whole lot of drinking. Did you go to the University of Minnesota? Eventually I did. Yeah, okay. I went, to, yeah, I went. And, and the good news was when I got out of college, I went to college for just three years, but I got a, I was playing hockey for the University of Minnesota at the time. Oh, really? And, uh, and I got a, a, a letter that I could try out with the Boston Bruins uh, National the National Hockey League. And uh, I, was a, I was a hell of a skater, and I had a really wicked slap shot. But I really wasn't 
as big as I should have been or could have been back in the day. And but the good news was that I also got a letter of acceptance to the University of Minnesota Medical School at the same time. And so I was agonizing over what to do. You know, I thought, well, I'd love to play hockey, but you know, and maybe my my future is going to be better off if I can go to medical school. Yeah. And so after agonizing over a bit, I went, you know, op- obviously opted to go to medical school. But I can guarantee in my next life I'm going to give the national. <laughs> The hockey league around, you know. Was there a lot of drinking connected to the hockey? Because you just think about that hockey guys, you know, you drink all night, you throw up on your st- skates, you go out there and you kick some ass. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, uh, you yeah, know, there was no shortage of drinking and smoking in those days, you know, and, and, and other uh, drugs that were going on. But, uh, yeah, they were they were a drinking bunch, you know, and, and they were fighting. And, and it, was, it was great fun at the time, you know, or <laughs> something. <laughs> I was 21 years old, 22 years old, so I had, I didn't have to sleep, you know. It was one of those types of deals. So. Yeah. Uh-huh. But, Were you taking uh, any kind of uppers or anything? No, not too much. There were some guys on, 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 the, on the group that were taking uppers. They were, you know, they'd come in with a big bowl of them, and it was like a whole bowl of M&Ms. You know, drugs in those days were easy to get, and uppers and downers and all that stuff, and, and, and some of the coaches were handing them out, you know. The, yeah. Some of the guys liked the uppers. I just. Never did much for me. It made me a little bit squirrely. You know, I didn't need them to show up in that regard. So, but, um, but you know, interesting is that when I get, went to medical school, one of the things I think about, and I tell my tell my sponsees about it, is that um, in in we had just one lecture on alcoholism in four years of medical school, one lecture in four years, and we were told at that time that it was a nutritional problem. And that uh, a better diet would certainly help these poor, unfortunate individuals with their alcoholism. Of course, now it's you know, it's there's light years more information about it, and, and that's one of the reasons why we're talking here today. Now you're retired after 37 years of of being a, a of urology, right? So yes, sir, yes, sir, yeah. yeah. This is what year uh, you're being told it's a uh, it's attrition. I uh, I retired in December of last year. So I've been retired for a year. Okay. And uh, and uh, it's it's been a it's been a really good time. Uh, the uh, the Jimmy Kimmel thing I think was interesting enough. <laughs> so <laughs> I got to tell that story because it's it's kind of funny. Yeah. The uh, uh, so I got a call from the Jimmy Kimmel show one day, and you know I hadn't calls like that before. I was but on Jimmy Fallon a few years back, and I oh you were because your name is if yeah. people were listening Dr. Dick Chop, you're a urologist and you you do a lot of, or did a lot of uh, bisectomies. Yeah. Okay. And so the uh, the show was kind of fun. The lady that that called me says, said, "Well, there's going to be three or four people on the show, and it's going to be people whose names you know befit their profession." The security guard, I think her name was Robin Banks. Robin Banks, she was she was wonderful. You know, she looked like Megan Thee Stallion. I mean, I never forget. She was, she was she was a big black lady, and she was pretty and good looking and funny. And then, uh, and of course, we, we, Jimmy said, "Make sure you don't tell your name, you know, until I ask you." And he said, "Well, he said, you know, he said, I think, yeah." You know, I told him, I he said, "How many of the vasectomies have you done?" And I said, "Well, I said seventeen thousand or so." And uh, he said. He said, well, he said, I, I suspect you would handle a lot of anatomy in that in that area. You know? I said, well, yes, yes. And he finally said, well, what's your name? I said, Dr. Dick Chop. So he started laughing, and the, and the camera guy started laughing, and I started laughing. I was, it was great fun. He did, he did a hell of a job. And, and, and people so, want to see it. They can just, you know, just YouTube, yeah. Jimmy Kimmel, Dr. Yeah. Dick Chop. It's not hard to yeah, find, exactly. and it is hilarious. Exactly. So you can't have, you can't have, you can't pay for advertising like that. You know? <laughs> no, you <that's>, can't. <laughs> that's the way it works. You know? Well, you so. can't pay for advertisement like your name. I mean, clearly you're an extremely bright, bright man. We'll get into, you know, <laughs> some of your credentials, but I mean, that's pretty good marketing plan. No. Uh, and, and I'm sure you experienced a lot of success with that. Well, certainly, you know, the interesting thing was, and, 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 uh, and uh, there's about, 30 urologists in Austin, and uh, and I think I was doing, well, last time I looked at the numbers, I was doing more vasectomies than, than two-thirds of all the urologists put together in Austin. So, I mean, you know, who would 
who wouldn't want to have their vasectomy by done by me? <laughs> That's just the way it works. You, know? you give people a, a T-shirt that says, uh, or, or they got, right, I was chopped? Uh, I was chopped at the urology team, exactly, yeah. And so. And, and one thing you did, I you know, I'd heard about you, uh, you know, working in TV news. I guess you'd started this up uh, maybe, I don't know, you can tell me how long, but the visectomy deal over the course of March Madness, right? You would do promotions yes. for guys to come and get a visectomy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, it was like 600 bucks for, you know, you get a, a visectomy on Wednesday and you can just yeah. ride it out through the first couple rounds. That's exactly right. Yeah, no, it, uh, we did that. We started doing that, I guess, 15 years ago, probably maybe 18 years ago. And, and of course, they, they'd come in, they'd get their shirt. And, uh, and, and of course, the guys would always bring their buddies with them. And sometimes they would, uh, sometimes they would, you know, be in the background heckling them while we're <laughs> so it, it was, it was great fun. You know, it was really great fun. So, so take yeah. me back to med school. You're sitting there, they're telling you this is a disease of attrition. What is, what is med school like? Pick it up from there. A lot of drinking involved. Well, you know, the, uh, the, the group that I was with in medical school didn't do much drinking. I was at least from my own perspective. I was pretty focused on getting to medical school because I knew that, that if I could do that, I'd probably be in good shape, you know, the rest of my life. And so I didn't want to, I didn't want to get off the rails in medical school and, 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 you know, we weren't, we weren't doing other substances that you can buy over the counter in most states now very much. And so, um, didn't really get exposed to that stuff until I got into my internship and residency. And that was out in uh, L.A. County General Hospital in 19, uh, 1971. So, and in those days, um, like I said, you could, you know, you could buy that stuff over the counter now. Yeah. But um, we did. I didn't do much drinking in those days because we were, you know, we were using other stuff. And then probably didn't get into the drinking until I got into uh, into New York City when I went and did my fellowship uh, at Sloan Kettering. And uh, a great place, wonderful place. I mean, it's, you know, it's reputation, you know, speaks oh, yeah, for itself. Yeah. I mean, when I saw that, just doing research on you, uh, it, it's like, damn. Yeah, it was, it was great, you know. And, and, and I thought, uh, after I had my fellowship, I, I met my to-be wife there. And she was doing a, uh, a fellowship in scoliosis or curvature of the spine. And so... My wife and I uh, moved to Austin in July of uh, 83. And uh, an interesting story at the time was we were driving down the freeway and one of my buddies was driving us and he had an open can of beer on the dash. And I said, Mike, I said, you know, take that away. I said, we're going to, you know, we're going to get stopped. He said, oh no, he says, open bottle is fine in Texas. And I thought, wow, this is a great state. You know? <laughs> I've come to the right place. And uh, you know, in Minnesota, you couldn't do that. Never could do that all the time I was growing up. But, and of course, rightfully so, that was changed not too long afterwards. But, uh, you know, so I'm in Austin and, and I'm flying high and everything is good. And I thought, you know, everything. So you're experiencing a, a lot of success. I mean, your credentials, we just went through them, speak for themselves uh and you you meant you you know inferred you're smoking a little bit of weed right i don't want to say anything out yeah, of school a little bit. Oh, yeah. so sure. you hear it here and there but nothing nothing crazy and so you're you're you know, kind of hitting it down the fairway yeah i mean you know i i I'm, i thought about it and i thought you know i i can't miss you know i mean i've got all these credentials and i've got all this extra training i'm obviously the smartest guy in the room i've got uh I've got a good looking wife and she's doing great things. And so, you know, we're rolling. I mean, it's 1983 and I figured, you know, I'm going to have so much success. I don't know what I'm going to do with it all. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to have a nice house and I'm going to have a nice car or stick. And maybe I'm going to have an airplane or two and, you know, maybe I'll get some horses. You know, I just, <laughs> those were things that were all out in front of me. And I thought, you know, it's going to, it's going to be wonderful, you know, so, but, what happened is now it's 1993. You know, I've been in Austin for 10 years, and uh, work wasn't all that much fun. And uh, it was becoming drill, 
you know, and I was doing the same thing day after day. And, and even though I was trying to bring new things to Austin, Texas, it was still got to be a little bit boring after a time, you know, and, and my wife wasn't behaving correctly. I you know, started drinking intermittently on the way home from work. And uh, the people around me were behaving badly. You know, the nurses weren't respecting me the way I thought they should. And people in the bank weren't behaving correctly. And, and all of a sudden, uh, it seemed to me I, I'm divorced after 17 years of marriage in 1998. And I'm looking at myself thinking, you know, what went wrong? What went wrong? You know, I was angry. I was resentful. My wife had had an affair. And I was 90% sure it was all her fault. And, and uh, you know, unfortunately, she was killed in the car accident the month before 9-11. But wow. it, was a, it was a really bitter pill for me to swallow, learning that once I'd been in AA for a couple of years, that the 90% fault was mine and it wasn't hers. And, and that's a tough thing, I think, for alcoholics to accept that, you know, I was such a self-centered, self-absorbed, probably an asshole from time to time that, uh, you know, no wonder that she, she divorced me. And, and so that was a tough one. That was a tough one for me. But uh, it was a result of being in the program, and that was freeing, ultimately, to, to understand what I was doing when I was drinking. Yeah. 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 Did you ever get a chance to make amends? I'm assuming no. Well... I did make amends, and, and uh, obviously not personally, I couldn't. But uh, mm -hmm. but part of the program is, is the amends, and there's no doubt that you know I had to write a letter to her, and uh, and make an amends to her, and and huge huge thing for me, huge things for my kids, and I have to make amends to my kids. A lot of people make amends too, as you know, mm -hmm. and uh, but but we must do it because it's freeing, you know, it's freeing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that pain um, can, you know, that's the, for me, it was a new thing to experience emotional pain. And whether it's yeah. gearing up to make an amends or whether you're unable to make one personally and you've got to make one a, a different way, uh, the freedom on the other side of that pain is, is it's just esteemable. I, I never thought I would experience actually working through, this is just me, working through something that was hard being sober. And I was the first time you do it, I was able to build on that. And then all of a sudden I'm feeling better about myself. But, you know, it's, oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, building on what you just said is not only is it, is it monumental the first time you go through, you know, the 12 step program and you're going to step four and five, but more importantly that we continue to do it because the way you and I are built, you know, people around us are going to, are going to, anger us and we're going to have some resentment yeah. and we have and we have to keep doing that stuff we have to keep doing it and that's that's the key we can't we can't ride on, on the wave and just hope that it's going to be for good forever and ever and, and unless we keep working on it i think was was it was it first of all you're exactly right um because i just from a mental health perspective, right? I owe it to the people around me to go to meetings uh, because uh, that'll enable me to communicate and just, I, I you can tolerate me and, and I'm more, to, you know, more tolerant. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's magical. And, and at the end of the day, I don't drink, get drunk and maybe die, uh, which is the end game. Uh, but back to, back to you and your story, you're doing so well. How the hell do you get, you know, do you get sober? Uh, because I, I got to imagine somebody with your level of success and like you mentioned, ego, uh, it's got to be something, I don't know, it, something prolific that triggers this whole deal, the sobriety thing. Yeah. So, you know, the issue that you and I had is, is, is the fact that we couldn't stop drinking even though we really wanted to do so. You know, I mean, how many times did you say, and I said, Monday morning, that's it. Yeah. I'm stopping. I'm stopping. And, and, and we really meant it. And, uh, but, you know, we just didn't see a good way out of the mess. And so I talked to my groups uh, a little bit about what I think it called the turning point. And for me, I remember it like it was yesterday. It was a Wednesday morning. And I was halfway to work. You know, it's 7 o'clock. And, uh 
I stopped and I thought, you know, I'm going to call in sick today and I'm going to go back and, start and keep drinking and then I'll go to work tomorrow. Well, what happened was that Thursday, the same thing happened. Friday, the same thing happened. And then Saturday morning came the day, you know, and my office manager and my senior partner showed up at my house. You know, 10 o'clock in the morning, I thought, how rude of them to come in and interrupt <laughs> my drink, you know. Yeah. But they suggested to me that I, that I go to treatment. And they suggested to me that if I didn't go to treatment, I might lose my job. And they suggested that if I didn't go to treatment, I might lose my wife. And they suggested that if I didn't go to treatment, I might lose my medical license. And so next thing I know, I'm on my way to tell the recovery center in Atlanta. And I think some people call that an intervention, you know, but that's exactly <laughs> what it was. You know. Yeah. And, and I don't know if you know much about Talbot, but it was an interesting spot. It was started in about 1993 or so. And he, uh, Dr. Talbot was a physician. He ended up living under a bridge. Is his name Matt Talbot? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. So there's Matt, there's Talbot Retreats. I've heard of those. Yeah, Talbot Recovery Center, exactly, in Atlanta. Okay. And uh, He lived and, under a bridge? Uh, he did. He did. Before, I mean, he got, you know, he, he got a lot lower than I ever did. And I guess my low spot was, was, was the fact that I had to be, you know, intervened to take, take to Atlanta a bit. But I remember, you know, having some, I think we call moments of grace. And uh, people who have been through this program, and I think you've probably had some of these, and, and, and think about this for a second. So, you know, moment of grace, I think if we look it up, it's called unmerited divine assistance given to the human condition for their regeneration. So I think my first moment of grace uh, was. Can you repeat that, that one more time? Moments of grace, so unmerited, divine, unmerited is the key, uh, meaning not deserved, <laughs> an unmerited divine assistance given to the human for their regeneration of their soul. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So the first one for me was when I was being driven away from my house on my way to the airport to go to Atlanta. In that giant hole that you and I had in our stomach that could only be subdued with alcohol went away and it never came back. That was a huge moment for me. And my second moment of grace um, was when I had been in Atlanta for about 10 days. And uh, the gentleman who ran our group was a, a great guy by the name of Woody Roberts. He was an Episcopal priest who was on loan to Atlanta. It's, and what has still been there for 15 years. So as you can imagine, there was about eight or 10 of us in our group that went through and guys would come in like me and then other guys would, you know, would, would depart. And so every 10 days or two weeks, Woody would say, all right, guys, sit down, and give us a brief synopsis about why you're here. And so Woody is across the table from me and there's a few guys on my right and a few guys on my left and the guys on my right started and the first guy said, you know, he talked about his DWIs and, and he lost a job, et cetera. And I thought in my judgmental mode, I said, you know, it's a good thing you're here. And, and uh, next guy talked about, you know, beating his wife and end up in jail and being in a car wreck and all that. And I thought, Jesus, you know, you should have been here six months ago, you know. And uh, so it goes around the table and finally it comes to me and everybody's looking at me. And, and it was like a blinding light. And man, it just hit me. I said, Jesus, I am one. You know, I deserve a seat in this, in this, in this room. <laughs> You're in the group. <laughs> I'm in the group. And I went to Woody afterwards and I said, Woody, I, I, had, I had a moment of revelation in there. I said, uh, I tell you what, I'm going to get this right the first time because I said, I'm not coming back. He said, Rick, he said, I, I kind of knew that about you. He said, you welcome. I'm, I'm sure you got it. <laughs> but the, the third part, which I think was the most important part, my third moment of grace is when, when I got back to Austin after being in Talbot for three and a half months. Oh, three and a half um, months. Three and a half months, yeah. Now, I'll t touch on that just in a minute. But yeah, that's awesome. When I got back to Austin, um, there was still something about the whole business I didn't understand. I, I, you know, I, I thought, you know, I'm kind of a smart guy. You know, why couldn't I? Why couldn't I do this on my own? Or why don't I understand it better? 
And so when I got back with my, my sponsor, Charlie Parker, he said, does anybody ever write to you to draw for you the vicious circle? And I said, no. He said, well, here's how it goes. And he, he said, all right. He said, and, and we're going to have to do this kind of on the air, but he said, yeah. the, the circle it shows on the right at about 3 o'clock for this. He says, is your first drink. I said, he says, write that down. So I did. He says, then draw an arrow down. He says, and that's your allergy to alcohol. And the allergy to alcohol gets manifested as what we call craving. I said, yeah, I read that. I, said, I understand the craving. He said, yeah. He said, that's what distinguishes us from the non-alcoholics. When mm. you and I start to drink, we don't know if we're going to stop at one drink or we're going to stop at 16 drinks. We don't know if we're going to stop this afternoon. And we don't know if we're going to stop until next Wednesday. He says, you and I have that problem. He says, my wife, he says, can have a half a glass of wine. He says, walk away from it, and touch it, and, and not have another glass of wine for two months. He says, you and I, he says, would drink our wine. We would drink her wine. And anybody else's wine would have to be on the table. Yeah. He says, and that's, that's the, the thing that makes us different from the average bear out there. And then we go along at the bottom of the circle, and we have to stop. And that's at the 9 o'clock position on the circle. And we have to stop because we have to go to work. We have to stop because our spouse says to us, you know, if you don't stop, I'm going to divorce your sorry ass. We stop because we're in jail. <laughs> we stop because we got DWI, whatever. We, and, and that part, he says, is actually pretty easy. And I'm thinking, well, I don't know. It wasn't easy for me the first time. But yeah. the real problem that we have with alcoholics is in the top part of the circle. And that's that business where we get restless and irritable and discontent. And, you know, and restless, I think, means that you want to be anywhere but where you are. And irritable is, you know, you're surrounded by idiots. It's the, it's the, it's the bozos in the line at Starbucks, and it's the, it's the jerk in the line at, at the bank. And, uh, and, and discontent means that you want to be anywhere but where you are. We'd like to get another job in another city. That'll take care of the problem. And unfortunately for you and me, Pete, you know this, that, that, uh, that's where we have all the problems in the top part of that circle. And and people, I think the best uh, example of that is I heard, you know, it's kind of like having a spring inside of us and, and it keeps getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And the only way we can get some relief is to drink. And all of a sudden we're back at the three o'clock position. We're going around and around that circle. And I thought, Jesus, that's me. You know, yeah. That is me. Finally, somebody explained it to me. And the good news is, of course, as we know, that if we have some type of a spiritual change or a psychic revolution or whatever you want to call it, that you can interdict that circle and, and prevent that from happening. So that was a huge, huge moment of grace for me. There's, more, there's an understanding that comes with that, and then there, there's a relief with that, right? Oh, tremendous, tremendous, yeah. I mean, uh, at least I understood what the problem was and why I couldn't stop on my own and why this this uh, this program, 12 Step, you know, gives us a toolkit that you and I can use to deal with the issues that we have every day. You know, another interesting story, uh, and I talk about this in my groups as well, is that I said, you know, wh what is it that sustains me now? And and the thing that sustains me is, is having sponsees, you know, taking guys uh, in who are struggling, you know, and sometimes they're brand new and sometimes they've been in the program for a while. And the interesting part of it was <laughs> I got most of my sponsors from my practice when I was still active, actively working. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so anytime I have a new patient come in, most of my patients were guys, I would always ask them as, as a rule, I said, you know, do you smoke and do you drink? And uh, I hear such things as, well, not every day. And, uh, or, yeah, I've had a drink in three days. Is that a red, that's a red, I know that's a red flag. <laughs> Big red flag coming up. So, but yeah, as soon as I hear stuff like that, I would offer to them the fact that, uh, you know, that I've been in the program for 10 years or 15 years at that point. And of course, then they would really open up. And, and that's where I got most of my sponsors. It was interesting. That's was interesting. awesome. What about the, yeah. th the three and a half months? What did that do for you, that long-term recovery? 
because for me, I went to just so you you know, I went to rehab, and then it was suggested I go somewhere else. Uh, like a sober yeah. living or a halfway house, yeah. if you yeah. want, uh, yeah. you know, sober living, if you want to dress it up. And, and it was about four months of being, or five months of being quote unquote institutionalized. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me in my life. Absolutely. 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 Well, you know, it brings me, it reminds me of the story, but when, when I was at Talbot, um, nobody really knew at the time how much one must spend at a treatment center. You know, do you go for a week? You know, do you go for three weeks? Do you go for two months? Do you go for six months? And so they started looking at their data for the past 10 years. And it was an interesting thing that came out is that the, the sobriety rate for the, for the people at Talbot, and most of them were docs in the original, you know, MDs in the original uh, series, the sobriety rate at the end of the year if they had been there for 30 days, it was about 45%. Not really great. The sobriety rate for the people who had been there three months plus was in excess of 95%. Wow. So something, something happens. Something happens that, you know, it appears that during that time, if you can adhere to the program, it gives you a better chance at retaining your sobriety. Now, you and I both know that a one-time immersion in a place like Talbot is going to help you, but without going forward and staying in the program, you know, you don't, ha- you probably don't have a great chance of keeping it up year after year after year. Yeah. Certainly, certainly don't have an opportunity to have this discussion that you and I are having right now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. How, how did you change as a person? Because you, you, you know, going back to where you said you were egotistical um, and you had, I mean, I, you don't want to say somebody's got a reason for a big ego, but you had a lot of stuff to puff your chest about, uh, puff out your chest about. And so now you get sober. How was your relationship with your patients, people you worked with, uh, different? Well, <laughs> it brings me up a little story about, about when I came back, we were, we were working at one of the hospitals and, and, uh, and one morning, there was a bunch of nursing students there and the nursing supervisor came up to me and she said, Dr. Chop, she said, would you take uh, Isabel here and, and bring her with you in the morning and teach her how to scrub and, and take her into surgery, you know, and all that. And I said, happy to do it, you know? And so she came with me and, and uh, you know, we taught her how to scrub and how to put on a mask, et cetera, and took her into surgery and everything. And, and, and scrubbing so, for people that don't know is just getting ready for surgery, right? Like getting dressed, ready for surgery, washing your hands, uh-huh. and getting all dressed, and having all the right things on, and everything. And so, so at the end of the deal, um, <laughs> she, and I heard this secondhand later. The, the, Isabel went back to her nursing supervisor and and, and said, uh, "Oh, she said Dr. Chop was so nice to me. He was so patient with me, and he." explained this to me and he, and he never raised his voice and you know I didn't make any mistakes according to him and it was just such a great experience and the nursing supervisor who had known me for a while said that's good because he wasn't always that way <laughs> <laughs> so, so I thought that was that was really <laughs> telling you know but uh, I think you know the, the, the business about staying in the program I think now, uh, you know, gives me what I call some spiritual insulation. And, and by that, I mean, I think it gives us help to deal with the problems that we all have, alcoholics or not. You know, people can be abrasive, and, and before I would have eaten them, and now it gives me some, some, some room to kind of stay away from them and, and, to, and to deal with it without, without getting crazy. You know, I think we need to try to be the least disturbed person in the room instead of the most disturbed person that we used to be. And and I think the other thing is that our job, I think, is to make it easier for others to love us. And uh, for others to ask, love others to love us. Uh, others to okay. love us, yeah. And and my wife tells me three times a week how happy she is that, that I'm sober. And uh, and uh, so that, that's that's great. And also, I think that, to your point, uh, the other thing that's happened to me is my time frame has been 
somewhat contracted. And by that I mean I don't worry so much about the issues that happened last week and the people that, that jumped on me last week. Uh, you know, do I, I still get some resentment from time to time, but not nearly. I don't ride them like I used to, you know, week after week. And also I don't worry so much about the future. And I'm not so into fear about what's going to happen if I run out of money next week or, you know, if this happens next week or that happens next week. I think it, what it does, it tends to keep me more in the day and think about the good things that are happening to me today. And this is one of them. Um, and I'm not, if I'm really tuned in and I've gotten, I've seen a couple of sponsors, I can actually get into the moment more than I used to. So, uh, I think the, the, the ultimate thing is that, you know, the treatment for alcoholism is, is not sobriety. That's a tough one for people to understand. The treatment is, is spirituality. And that, and that's, that's the key, I think, you know. What was your spiritual foundation before you got sober? Oh, probably not very good. You know, I, uh, people ask me when I give these talks at the, at the treatment center to talk about what, what's the difference between spirituality and religion. And uh, I tell them up front, I said, listen, I said, you know, I said, you must understand that religion has sustained people for centuries. And whether you're Christian or Judaism or Islam or Buddhist, I said, religion has done wonders for many, many, many people. Um, Religion. I, I went to Catholic school when I went when I grew up, and you know, I didn't eat meat on Me Friday, too. and yeah, and uh, went to confession and all that other business. And uh, but religion, I think, is something we get from the outside, as versus spirituality, which I think is something that we get more from the inside. And the people I think who are practice and try to be spiritual or at achieve some level of spirituality kind of have two threads you know they they have a capacity to have some relationship with their sacred being whether it's god or the universe or a higher power uh, i think they have a, a capacity to feel love and the second part of it is that, that they i think try to share this with others and so spirituality sometimes can be a nebulous thing to talk about but but in a short span of time i think that that's the difference for me would you say that because you had a reputation like of, you know, maybe people that were close to you, maybe, and that weren't that close, they may have not known about the seriousness of your alcohol problem, but clearly you go away for three and a half months. There's an intervention. You've got some work to do to restore your reputation. Would you say that recovery, 12 steps, that was pretty much the only way out of that? Because if somebody thinks about that, you know, okay, I'm going to come out of this three and a half month stint and I'm just going to get back, you know, go back to work. And that's got to be terrifying because, you know, I, I, I had the gift of desperation. So I, I everybody knew I had a problem. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I, I was at the bottom, uh, but you were still, you know, you walk back into this, this job where people know who you are. You've got a reputation within the, the community, I'm sure like uh, regionally and, and also your, your, your urology community. Yeah, so the, uh, you know, we think, we think that nobody knows about our drinking. Is that, so that's and, what you uh, thought? You thought you kind of had it? Yeah, I thought, you know, I thought nobody knows about it. But of course, the, you know, my neighbors who saw me out there with a the garden hose in one hand and a bottle of vodka in the other, they probably knew about it. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I'm sure that the people at, at work who saw me shaky in the morning, stuff like that, they probably knew about it. And, uh, but the interesting thing <laughs> that struck me so, so much when I got back is I thought, to your point, I thought, man, I'm going to have to be careful so that none of my patients know about that I'm in recovery and that, you know, da 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 da. And so I remember going to one of my first few meetings and, uh, there were three or four of my patients there. <laughs> And they came up, they came up to me and said, Hey, doc, how are you doing? Man? Glad to see you. I'm glad you're here. And then they walked off and I thought, Jesus, you know. Isn't this great? They're happy that I'm here. Everything's good. You know, they didn't they didn't give me any grief. They didn't say, you know, I'm glad you're here, you know, because you needed to be here. It was just wonderful. So that kind of was a really freeing moment. And from that moment on it was it was a matter of 
I didn't worry so much about if people saw me at a meeting or if people talked to me about alcoholism and all that. So. Was that the moment where you kind of were able to open up? Because what you do is important. You know, you speak at treatment centers. You're somebody yeah. who people yeah. listen to. You're articulate. You have a great message that you carry. What, was that the moment when you were, you know, you, you see people, patients in meetings and you, you see the positive reaction? Was that the moment where you say, hey, I'm going to, I, I, I'm fine with coming out about this? Oh, sure. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, 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 that was a, a pivotal moment for me. And uh, from that moment forward, you know, I just didn't have any problem telling people about what I was doing. You know, I didn't, I didn't stand on the street corner and jump up and down and, and tell people about it. But certainly, if, if it came up in, in, a, in a discussion or if it came up in the office, I had no problem talking about it. And, and more often than not, once I started talking about it, that's when people really opened up to me about their problems. Yeah, me too. I mean, that's the same thing. Yeah. I never, I always say, you know, I don't bang, you know, big books over people's head. But if you, no. if we get there somehow in the conversation, or if you get close to me at all, um, this is something that eventually is going to come up. Certainly, certainly. And hopefully, yeah. Yeah. And for people that are yeah. listening that aren't sure about how it will be received, what, what we just heard from, from Dr. Chop and from what I've experienced, all the fear, right? They're going to, when you get sober, people are going to receive me differently now that I'm sober or, you know, my career, my relationships are going to fall apart. I'm going to be judged. That to me, and I can't think, I'm sure it's happened once or twice, but not that I can remember have I received a negative response from anyone uh, when no. I've told them about being sober. So that's all BS. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And and the other thing is that, uh, and I think, you know, you and I have both experienced this, Pete, but the fact that people can put the 12 step issue on hold while they think they want to get the rest of their life together. Yeah. And I think that, you know, a lot of 12 steppers, you know, they, they settle for mere sobriety uh, instead of a real transformation, you know, of the self. And, and I think we need to understand the 12 step program is not a worthiness contest. It is something that will make the rest of our lives wonderful. And so I tell my sponsees, you know, you, you got to make sure that your sobriety is tight and that you're doing the program because then all the rest of the stuff in your life will get better. You know, your job will get better. Your relationship with your wife, your relationship with your kids, all that stuff will be better as a consequence of you doing the program and not the other way around. And my brother and just, I, I, go ahead. That's what? No, no I say, I think that's important for folks to understand that, We've got to do this part first, and then the rest of it will fall in line. It, I mean, that is it. My, my, and we got to keep doing it. My brother called me the other day. I mentioned he's sober for a long, long time, about as long as you. And he, he said, don't let the gifts of sobriety get in the way of the gifts of sobriety. And I told him that years ago because my sponsor, Steve, told, <laughs> told me that. And, he's yeah. like, and it was just one of those things where, and that's it. Like, you can't let stuff that happens to you, or or we suggest you don't, right? That the stuff that happens to you along positive things get in the way of, of your program because that is the only way for me to stay fulfilled. Anything I put yep. in front of that, I'm going to lose. I, I've got a history of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah, and, and I tell my sponsees, I said, you know, I said, you don't have to beat the drum every day in, in the 12 step program, but what we don't want to do is we don't want to coast and, and we don't want to go weeks and weeks without going to a meeting or weeks and weeks without talking to your sponsor, uh, that type of thing, because that, that way, you know, Mark Houston was the one I we talked about a little bit earlier. He said, you know, he says, I don't care how long you've been in the program. He says, if you take an alcoholic and put enough dis ease before them, enough dis ease, they will drink. And so whether you're in the program a year, whether you're in 15 years, if you get in the ditch and you're not doing the deal, you have a potential to pick up that drink again. Because then, and you know, anybody ask somebody when they do, why they do that? They, you know, to a man, they say, I don't know. I don't know. It just happened, you know. So I have to, I have to do it as often as I can. And, and taking care of sponsors keeps me in it 
because I have to stay in front of those knotheads from time to time, and, and they ask me questions that I don't know. So I have to go ask my sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> what do you What do you feel about the fact that you are, you know, esteemed professionally as far as your ability to carry the message? I mean, that's got to I got to imagine that really helps people you're working with because hey, like we talked about at the very beginning of this thing, alcoholism is the great equalizer. I've talked, yep. been lucky enough to talk to people like you. I've talked to other doctors. I've talked to pro athletes, uh, you know, uh, super agents, and they've all they've all got it too. I mean, and and they had every reason not to do it, and certainly to get sober long before they did. But it just didn't it didn't happen, you know. And it's got to be great for you. I guess it's a long way of me saying it. it's just got to be great for you to carry the message. Yeah, you know, and and so. Um, you know, you touched on it right away early on in our talk today is, is the fact that it affects everybody. And, and if I can, you know, lead, you know, carry some credence and carry some weight into this as, as a professional, uh, then so be it. Um, my, my story hopefully is not going to be terribly different from somebody who does something else. But um, I think, Sometimes folks will look at me and say, well, you know, if he can do it, certainly I can do it, you know, because he's done the things that need to be done. And, and if I do what he's done, then perhaps I'm going to have the tools in this program to stay sober and to, stay, and to have a good life. And so, yes, yes, I, you know, the, the fruits of this business is not only for me, but it's all the people around me. And that's, that's the key. Well, and, and as we get closer to wrapping up, I'll, I'll let you out of here in a couple minutes. I want to just go back to, because this is something I'm curious about, and for people listening to this that aren't sure, you know, if they can stop or if they ever will. When, when you're, that intervention happens, can you describe, you know, what, what made you uh, or the situation that made you say yes, right? Because clearly people had told you you needed to stop before, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming actually. But that intervention that day. Uh, yeah. you made a decision. How did, how did that happen? Well, you know, I, I tell folks that, um, my, my decision was coerced. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, but and not to make light of that, but no, uh, I mean, the, we can make a light of it because we're sober, but I hear you. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, but during that moment, I remember sitting there, after having talked to my my uh, office manager and my senior partner, I thought, you know, uh, maybe this was another moment of grace. Maybe I thought I need to do something else because what I'm doing is not getting me to where I want to be. And so at that moment, I was I, I became open to trying something different. I didn't know if it was going to work. And, uh, but what I was doing wasn't doing it, wasn't doing the deal. And so I, I think if, if folks can be open to trying a new approach and a new avenue, there's a strong chance that it's going to work for them. You know, we, we hear people all the time saying, well, A didn't work. You know, I tried A and it didn't work and I'm, now I'm drinking again. And in defense of that, I think that, you know, there are some people who are probably not alcoholics and they may be uh, binge drinkers and, and, and for them, maybe A is not the deal. But it's been my experience that the great majority of folks who will put in the time and have a, and have a sponsor, I think that's important. I really do. I really think you need a sponsor. At least I did. Um, that if you will do that and really put your heart and soul into it for a period of time, that your chances of remaining sober and, and, and having a spiritual experience go up and up and up. It doesn't happen for everybody. And I don't think even Bill Wilson, if he were sitting here right now with us, would say, yeah, this is the answer for every alcoholic who ever walked or talked. Yeah. Yeah. Agree. And the, but, but just like you, it really, really worked for me. Where, where did you find the willingness to stay and the humility to stay in, in treatment for, for three and a half months. Um, I think again, 
uh, it was the fact that I was going to do it right the first time and I was going to give it a 100% chance of seeing if it was going to do right before I, you know, pronounced judgment about whether I did the right thing or not. I thought, you know, I'm going to give this, I'm going to give this a whirl. I'm going to give it my best shot. That's my personality. Um, I, I got really good at drinking. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I thought, you know, I, I got really good at playing hockey. And I like to be really good at what I do. And I thought, I'm going to give this my best shot. And I'm going to really see if I can't get good at that. And the rest is history. I mean, it's just, it, it, it's changed my life. It's been the best 15 years of my life. Pete. Um, I couldn't have asked anything better in the past 15 years than what I've had to date. Yeah. I, I love it. But the last question for you, what do you tell the person? I, I like to ask pretty much everybody this. What do you tell the person who's struggling to get a day? And like you said, the person who's coming in like you and I did and, and says, I want to, I want to stop today, but they can't. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's a difficult thing. You know, I, uh, in, in, and you hear it in the meetings all the time, you know, just don't drink today and just don't drink today. For me and for my sponsees, I think to do that all on your own is, is tough. And, and for me, it would have been insurmountable because, you know, you and I both said a hundred times or a thousand times, this is it. Today's the last day. And I think without some help, uh, it's, it, tough for most people to do that. Uh, there's a lady that both you and I know who was able to do that all on her own. And, and I was floored when I, when I heard that because I thought, boy, that is, that is not the norm. Yeah. Know, that is not the norm. Most people can't do it on their own. So I, I think it, I recommend to those folks that they get some help and, they, and, and go to a meeting, get a sponsor. Go to a meeting, get a sponsor. Because if we have, we have I think, that we have to have somebody to be able to bounce this stuff off and, and to do it all on our own is, is a tough one. And I think most of us just don't have the wherewithal to do it. Yeah. Well, Dr. Chop, thank you for helping, helping us do it, you know, um, together and, and not alone yeah. today. I, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate the time and the message. Yeah, it was wonderful, Pete. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, you got it. And this, just so you know, this will be, we'll put this up on Thursday and I'll make sure I send you the link. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, I want to meet you in person. Yeah, I hope to see you around campus. Let's make it happen. I can't thank you enough. All right, sir. Thanks All right, so Dr. Much. Chop. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for listening to The Payoff with Pete. Once again, I'm Pete Souza, And of course, we are part of the Rogue Media Network. All kinds of good podcasts you can find at roguemedianetwork.com. And of course, you can find this podcast and all those other ones wherever you get your podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, other spots like that. This has been a Rogue Media Network 